I am struggling with language and what language I should and shouldn't use when talking about this conflict. Um, there are people who are supporters of either Israel or Palestinians or Palestinians and Hamas who want me, who want the media, and I'm in the media, to use certain words to describe what they think the other side is doing wrong. And so I am asked why I do not use the word terrorist more often. I am accused of bias because I'm not using, as many Palestinian supporters are, using the phrases ethnic cleansing and a new holocaust and um, a new genocide. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu called Hamas the new Nazis. And so I'm going I'm to talk about where legal definitions exist for some of the phrases that people are using. And if you want to use that phrase, that is within your right. But I'm just concerned about whether... I, I don't really know what I'm concerned about. I just want to talk uh, about this. First of all, from a legal sense, with Cathy uh, Powell, who's an associate professor of public law at UCT, and then with novelist, essayist, and academic... Imran Kavadia, uh, Kathy. Good afternoon. Are there good afternoon. are there good legal afternoon. definitions? I mean, those legal definitions might not be accepted by one side or other in this conflict. But are are there legal definitions of what genocide is and isn't? What ethnic cleansing is and isn't? What Holocaust is and isn't? Um, yes, I'm. I'm not an expert on on the Holocaust history, so I'm not sure how um, those uh, scholars have defined that term. But yes, there's a definition for genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, war crimes. There isn't a definition for terrorism, at least not a determinate one. Determinate one. Uh, this, that one is still open. Um, but mo many of the terms that are be being thrown around in the debates these days are in fact defined and could be used more carefully. So we have at least some starting points. Okay, what is the international definition of genocide? The place to go would be the Rome Statute, which is the latest um, iteration of it. But it is the, the killing, um, or there are also lesser forms of harm, but let's focus on killing, of a group or members of the group with the intent of destroying that group. So there's a specific genocidal intent behind genocide. It's killing because the members belong to that group. And how um, is group how is group defined? Because the Israelis the, the Israelis yes. have been quite blunt about the fact that they want to get rid of Hamas. They want to kill everybody who is in any way a leader of Hamas. Does Hamas qualify as a group under the legal definition of genocide? That's a good question because as a as a governmental group or a um, political movement, no, they would not. Uh, they, they would not uh, satisfy the prerequisites for a group. Usually, one speaks about racial, ethnic. Um, there, there, there is a list of possibilities there. Um, I think what Israel is being accused of is um, reining its its own attack, not just on. Um, Hamas as the particular group of militants, but on all the occupants of Gaza. Uh, in other words... You see, Cathy, is, sorry to interrupt, yes. but is Israel would say, and by my putting yes. Israel's point of view forward, it doesn't mean in any way I support Israel's point of view. I understand. But, but Israel is saying we are not trying to get rid of all Palestinians. The fact that we are telling Palestinians to move away from areas where they are in greater danger, I mean, there is no safe place in Gaza mm -hmm. at all, but we are warning them to move away, shows that we are not trying to wipe out the Palestinians as a group. We are only trying to wipe out Hamas. I'm afraid then we start talking about war crimes. If we accept Israel's claim that actually this is all just aimed at Hamas, um, then we could argue, fine, there's no genocidal intent. Um, then our problem would, be, would shift to how 
uh, Israel is carrying out its campaign against Hamas. Um, you see, Kathy, I've been fairly comfortable using the, the term war crime to describe both yes. what the Palestinians uh, and what, the, what Hamas, the Hamas are not the Palestinians, yeah. but what Hamas did on the weekend of the 7th and 8th, 8th to Israeli yes. citizens and their kidnapping of hostages. The Israelis saying that number is now believed to be 222 and equally um, Israel's casual disregard of potential civilian collateral killings. Uh, and, and that's because I've heard a lot of definitions of international war crimes and both what mm-hmm. Israel is doing and what Hamas did and would probably like to have the opportunity to do again are potential war crimes. So let's set that yes. one aside. Ethnic cleansing, is there an international re- legal definition of that? Yes, that is the... Um removal of members, again, of a group understood in similar terms to the group, groups defined for genocide um, from, a, from a territory, from a geographical area. Um, so if, um, if all, Palis- all of Gaza were to be cleared of all Palestinians, then we're talking about ethnic cleansing. Um, Which is what Palestinians and Pal- Palestinian supporters feel is happening, and it is what Israel is denying is happening. Correct. Um, once we've got the meanings of the words, though, we do need to start looking at the evidence for one or the other. But I, I, yes, that is exactly what, what uh, Palestinians are averring, alleging is happening in, in Gaza. And it's what uh, Israel is denying it's doing, ethnic cleansing or genocidal intent. Are you prepared to step onto the minefield of presenting evidence for or against these terms that we've been discussing? Well, yes, I am. Uh, I think it does have to be done. Um, We we can't just stay within the comfort zone in this this, uh, area of atrocities. uh, let me state for the record that the Hamas attack of the 7th and the 8th was, were war, um, there were war crimes if, if there is an armed conflict between Israel and Palestine. Failing that, um, I would define them as acts of terrorism, but then I have to explain my definition of terrorism, which, um, which can differ from one commentator to the other, but it is a, it is a, a violent assault with the aim to, um, strike terror into a target group, and it is aimed at changing how a, an area is governed. So that's what I would call the, the Hamas attacks of the 7th and the 8th. On the Israeli responses since then, um, whether there is a clear focus just on Hamas, when you have the Israeli defense minister calling a, describing Palestinians as human animals, That is problematic. Um, Whether there is a clear attack on just Hamas when you have a campaign of, in effect, carpet bombing, which is justified on the basis that Hamas is somehow hiding under the ground or somewhere, but there's absolutely no attempt to to limit uh, civilian damage. And then also, then you also start looking at war crimes, because if there are enough war crimes that Israel's committing, you, it starts to cast doubt on Israel's claims that it's aiming just at Hamas and not at the occupants of Gaza or, or, or Palestine per se. In particular, if you start to add the, the increased death rate in West Bank. So that's the evidence that starts to affect how we apply the law to the facts. Thank you very much, Associate Professor of Public Law at UCT, Cathy Powell. Listening to that and joining us now is novelist and essayist academic Imran Kuvadia. Imran, good afternoon. Good afternoon, John. Um, Your thoughts on this. I mean, what what words are you prepared to use? What words would you shy away from? What words do you hope people don't use? I'm just interested to know what you think. First of all, you have my sympathy because I think in this conflict, I mean, not to use a trivial description, but both sides are clearly working the referees, which is the media. You know, and we're in a conflict which is essentially communal mobilization. Each side has warped language so intensely that I think we all have to step back and ask ourselves some questions about to what extent we do we go along with certain descriptions and certain um, uh, certain ways of assessing the situation. So, for example, um, 
and this is not to cast blame only on these Israelis, but often when people talk about Hamas, they say Hamas, you know, uh, has fired 300 rockets or 3,000 rockets, but they don't count the number of rockets in exchange, which is a bizarre, bizarre thing to do. Um, but in general, I think, I think as, as, as well-meaning people, we have to not be sucked into that, into that intense warping of language around who is our friend and who's our enemy. And I think, you know, there are many writers, many humane writers who try and reassert um, a certain kind of middle ground about humanity. You know, I think about how George Orwell reminds us to, to you know, to, to question the kinds of language that come, come to us from very powerful structures. Um, I think of Hannah Arendt, who as an essayist reminds us that the real question here is that there are stateless people who don't have rights, the Palestinians, and there is a people with the state, the Israelis, who have a long memory of being stateless and not being treated as without rights. And so the, the issue is here is not which side is ultimately good or bad, because human beings exist in a polarity between those things, but rather how to fix the situation, not to allow the situation to continue for decades or generations as has happened. And I think the final writer I think of is, is, is Montaigne, who reminded us that the humane middle course is still the best way to respond to politics, that passions can be important, but also stepping back um, moderation and human decency are how we should define our political views. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things, look, um, one of the things I have to try and understand is why it is that this issue raises such very, very powerful emotions in South Africans. And I think I sort of understand it, even if I don't yeah. understand it it fully. And then I start to wonder why is it that so many people become so impassioned that they lose the possibility of mutual empathy? That, yes, that and they... I think, yes, I, yeah, I agree entirely. And in fact, it, it's worse than that. I mean, to some extent, people, uh, Peter Beinhardt, the great essayist on this, kind of commentator on this question, talks about Jewish organizations playing games to minimize Palestinian suffering. But the same goes in the other direction. There's very disturbing material on the internet minimizing the scale of the atrocities that we saw uh, against Israeli civilians. So it's people get impassioned, but they also become cruel and cynical towards the other side. And I think as, as relative bystanders, we at least can represent some uninvolved humanity. But clearly for Jews, for Palestinians, what's at issue is a feeling of communal um, abol you know, extirpation. I think for Jews, often with memories of the Holocaust or the Palestinians with these general, generations long experience of dispossession, they feel that they are being destroyed as a community. And, you know, they're not entirely wrong, but I think it's important for us to bring them back to help them come back from from that political passion. And as um, Hariri said, uh, that on the 7th and the 8th, for some terrible moments, Israel was stateless. Jewish people were stateless again because this took them back to the deeply embedded ge cultural genetic history of, 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 of Holocaust and of, and, and of oppression. And in, in the same interview, he talked about the messianic views of Benjamin Netanyahu and the success of right-wing governments who have thought to impose an entirely inhumane and, you know, uh, all destined to be always unsuccessful uh, um, solution for the Middle East, which excluded the Palestinians and their rights. Yes, I mean, absolutely. And what's interesting is that Benjamin Netanyahu's father um, was a historian. and Much of his analysis of the Jewish predicament in the world is borrowed from Hannah Arendt's views about Judaism and its status. Um, but, you know, equally, the, the absolutist visions of Hamas really have no place um, in our society, in our world, I think. Um, and the fact that various sides encourage, encourage them and don't spend our time talking them down and telling them to alter the situation rather than, you know, um, criticizing their beliefs. I think that, you know, that's a problem. I think above all, this is a problem of the United States. The United States is a great liberal power. You know, in many occasions it is, I know many left-wing South Africans don't believe this, but in many ways it's a force for good. But in this case, it is a force for confusion, misdirection, and bloodshed. <laughs> and that's even with the best American president. So yeah. I think you know, some of this is about the American confusion about what a liberal order is. 
and I, I, I look at this, and um, I was at the launch of Andrew Brown's novel about yeah. the Middle East, The Bitterness of Olives, and, and Andrew said, look, America has been for many, many years giving $3 billion a year of military aid to Israel. Why have they at no point said this aid is contingent upon you're getting back to a real search for a pal- search, to a solution to the Palestinian issues. And I, and I think of the Arab countries who have been normalizing relationships with Israel. And I'm thinking to myself, why did you not make it a precondition for normalizing your relationship with Israel that all sides involved commit to a deep, thorough, fully engaged search for a solution to the Palestinian question? That would be an absolutely rational thing to do. But to do that, we have to separate two things. One is a Jewish interest in survival. And you can absolutely understand why that interest exists and is more powerful amongst Jews than amongst any other community. The other thing is a greater Israel interest in territorial expansion, seizing further land and religious sites from the Palestinians. And I think that has to be seen as beyond the pale. But from an American point of view, I think in many ways from a European point of view, those two forces are fused indissolubly and they, they will not choose between them and can't divide, you know, can't divide the very good part of that from the very destructive part of that. Imran Kuvadia, thank you very, very much. I found that really very helpful. Um, Imran is a novelist and essayist and an academic.